Hey everybody, welcome to part two on this uh, teardown, this FACO machine that I've got. If you haven't seen the first part of this episode, then there's uh, a link in the description to see part one. Uh, I just simply take off this main control box off the, uh, the wheeled chassis and take out a few items which we're going to look at in this video. So before we get started, I just want to say thanks to uh, Mike from Mike's Electric Stuff for tipping me off about this one. It's uh, always nice to find things a bit local. So I guess we need to go into a little bit more detail about what a FACO machine is and uh, how it actually works. The word FACO is actually shortened from FACO emulsification. Um, it uses a hollow ultrasonic needle which vibrates and allows you to cut into the eye and cut the damaged lens into small pieces which then sucked up through the needle and then there are other tools involved which allow uh, the surgeon to insert a new lens into the eye uh, so the patient has uh, restored vision. So in reality there is a lot of uh, things that go on to actually provide a, what is actually quite a simple process and that is just simply to uh, remove the old lens from the eye and replace it with uh, an artificial one. Now I am a little bit disappointed that I don't have the hand tools which came with this machine. Uh, this is literally just the control of the actual hand tools with the ultrasonic um, tools are not with it unfortunately. And it's a shame because I think there would have been uh, some interesting things to see in that because it's not just a simple uh, needle that moves about at ultrasonic, ultrasonic speeds. They actually have shapes and it, it actually moves in a, in a pattern. So they're actually quite sophisticated devices. It's a shame I didn't get one, but at least we've got the main box to take to pieces. Okay, so the box. It looks like there's a main um, chassis in that sort of is in the whole area and all these bits of plastic are just bolted onto it. Um, there's a big steel plate at the back here and that looks like it runs through to the front. Um, the monitor is held on with a big bracket here, uh, that is, of course is broken and there was a, a sheet of glass in front here but that was completely smashed to pieces. So um, I've actually already removed the, the screen, um, it's just sat on here at the moment. It actually removes quite easily, uh, presumably for when it's moved and um, shipped originally. So I'll just take that off, uh, we'll start removing some of the plastics from this and actually try and get on the inside. Okay, the screen is actually just held on with this just one securing screw and then it slides off like that. Now I have actually already removed the, the connector there. Okay, first up we'll have a look at the monitor. Obviously it's just a self-contained unit. Um, the buttons on the side here um, all have rubbery surrounds around them so there's obviously some IP rating on on that. I'm not sure whether this was touch screen. I don't think it was. Uh, given the amount of buttons you have around the, uh, around the outside you probably would be able to do away with those if it was actually touch screen. Um, this here it seems to be some kind of plastic. Looks the sort of plastic that you would write, you'd be able to write on and then wipe it off. Um, unless it's that's actually a touch, a touch sensitive thing uh, because there is actually a couple of arrows on on there as well. So let's see if there's anything interesting under there when we take the lid off. On the back we've just got um, eight screws to take the cover off. This rod appears to be uh, some kind of tightening nut. I think uh, you could position this monitor into, into a set place and then tighten this and it would lock into place but I think uh, when this was dropped all this got smashed because it's all just wobbles around now. Okay we've got a nice uh, machine block of aluminium there, presumably the electronics are under that. Cables, some ferrite filters, uh, that looks like the backlight driver uh, so it's obviously going to be a CCFT backlight. And it looks like everything's mounted on this uh, base plate of uh, prefamulated amulite. Very important you have that in a machine like this. And here you can see uh, where rather a large amount of damage has been done when this machine was uh, disappeared out the back of this uh, this guy's van. Um, so it's obviously hit the screen here and pushed this right into there and started pulling out the bolts and screws and everything. So.
buttons from the front. Uh, interestingly, how they've done the backlight on these, um, it looks like there's actually a, a laser diode or possibly just an LED just here. And we look, we have fiber optics coming down and running through into the uh, semi transparent rubber. Yeah, actually, it's not, a, it's not a laser diode, there's just an LED in there. Um, so we've got a metallic reflective backing and the fibres run down and it looks like they've been partially crimped, um, presumably to make the light come out of the, the fibre. And underneath the silver, we have just standard tactile domes. Wow, well, crazy amount of machining gone into that. Um, just for a shield on the back of the LCD. Mad. You would have thought they would just put a um, a tin plate cover over the back. Uh, here we can see the PCB for the uh, LCD controller driver. Um, again, this is branded Allegan. Uh, we've got a programmable device just here, which is, and that's using the an MC six eight HC seven one eleven E nine something or other. Presumably, uh, some kind of 68,000 base microcontroller. And the screen appears to be a Samsung uh, Wise View LTM 150XH. Okay, let's take a look at the main unit. The, As I said before, I think all these plastics just bolt onto a, a, a central metal chassis. So I'm going to remove all of the plastics as much as I can, and then we'll see about how to get into uh, into the metal box. Um, here we've got the other end of the cable that went out to the monitor. Looks like there's been some damage there. I'm not sure whether that was caused when it uh, had its fall or whether that's just from wear and tear. And you can see a bit more of the uh, damage there. Get that in the light. It's obviously landed there and broken these plastics. Very, very thick plastic. It looks like it's uh, fiberglass reinforced, it, I think. Ah, these are slotted screws and they actually only do a, a quarter turn and release. So possibly there's a, an access panel behind here. We should notice that before I start taking all the plastic off. And it looks like we've got another access panel here as well. It's already started to come off. I'm just going to remove this uh, pump assembly because it does appear to be one complete unit. So it might give me a bit, a bit more access to get in a bit deep, deeper. Oh, again, these are quarter turn screws, obviously to allow you to take it out easily.
Okay, and there's the back of the pump assembly. Uh, this looks like it's a similar arrangement with these little quarter turn screws just to remove the panel. So this is the um, embedded computer, it's made by Zyatec Corporation, it seems to be a model number ZT200-09-S365, interesting there is a sticker just there, you probably can't read that, but it says special for Allergan, Allergan? Right, there's not much left in here now, there's a speaker up in the corner there, um, we've got looks, what, what is like a, um, a hard disk or solid state drive or something just in down in here I can't quite see um, then there's the power supply and that is about it there's cables and bits and bobs so that was the rear panel uh, these are the connectors that went out to the foot switch and the um, the other parts the uh, air pump and things like that um, interestingly it's got uh, it's got audio ports here, but there's nothing actually connected to them. Yep, looks like we've got a PC card, uh, 32 megabytes. Um, That is labelled White Star Ice System, ice technology designed for increased control and efficiency, blah blah blah, manufactured for AMO Inc. Obviously contains all of the um, operating system for the computer. Right, that's just an empty chassis now, so we can get rid of that and have a look at these uh, bits that we've taken out. Yeah, let's have a look at these bits in turn. Um, this is just one of the, the back plane, the back connector panel. So not really much on there. It's literally just connectors on a uh, on a PCB. So nothing much to see there. Okay, let's have a quick look at this uh, peristaltic pump assembly. Uh, so this came out as a single unit. Um, it looks like there's two sections to this. Uh, we actually have the pump arrangement here. And this looks like um, some flow control and monitoring um, section uh, because they are actually divided up into two um, on the back here we have uh, the drive motor that uh, looks like a stepper motor large stepper motor inside there there is a uh, some kind of rotary encoder on the top providing a bit of feedback um, and that's all mounted on this uh, beautifully machined aluminium plate um, which then runs through to the front and you can see the the actual wheel which um, pumps the fluid through the pipes using these uh, little wheels which crush the pipe and push the fluid through. And this section here, as I said, I think is some kind of flow control and monitoring section. Um, again, it's all made out of this beautiful um, hard anodized machined aluminium. Um, we have this uh, plastic cartridge thing installed in here. So the uh, fluid pipes would have come up here, round the pump, down into this section, which would have then gone into this part here. Now I'm not entirely sure what that is for, but it goes in and then comes straight out um, to a separate port um, just there. It's actually magnetic, it sticks onto this centre piece, which pushes in against the spring. I think what that is, there's a diaphragm inside here and as the pressure increases, it pushes that um, out into there and it can detect it, I think, for, um, check, for monitoring the pressure of the, uh, the fluid. Um, these two uh, ports here, um, obviously there would have been, I'm not quite sure how this would have been actually plumbed up, uh, but what these two sections are, 
these are attached to two solenoids, which are on the back here, these two. Um, and they can actually push outwards and crush the pipe against these two sections on here, on this aluminium locking arm thing. So when that's in place, the solenoids would activate and that would actually seal off these two, two pipes there. So uh, it's obviously for flow control. If we take a quick look at the back, there's not really much on here. It's literally just there's a PCB with um, connections on. These went over and plugged it into the um, embedded computer. Um, we've got this rather large sensor uh, arrangement there. I'd be kind of inclined to have a look at that, but uh, I'm going to see if anybody wants to make use of this before I start taking it to pieces completely. Um, the solenoids are attached to this uh, really nicely machined bit of aluminium. So quite simple there, there's just uh, two connections to each of these solenoids because they're just a simple electromagnet. Now this section is the known as the IV pole, so we have a motorised system to uh, raise the bag of saline solution um, up into the air. The uh, It's quite a large bit of kit, I can't get it all in shot, so this is the bottom of it, um, and it goes, the total length is about a metre. Um, the total extension seems to be about 750 millimetres, so 75 centimetres, so it can raise up fairly high. The control mechanism is uh, through this plug connected to the back of the system. Um, so we'll just open this box up and see what we have inside. Right, so we've just got a, a fuse in there. Right, this looks like it's uh, got some kind of microcontroller on it. So like the air pump, there's probably a serial interface. Over the, uh, over the connections there. Um, this will actually supply the power as well. Um, so there's a, probably a little serial protocol just to uh, tell this thing to go up and go down. It might even be able to specify go up 10 centimeters or something. Uh, but because I wasn't able to turn it on, I don't know, do not know, unfortunately. So there's a number of wires that come out of this control board, um, which run through to the motor at the base here. Um, that is a that has an Allegan part number. The motor is um, a Dunker motor, type G30. So what I think we've got here is the um, motor, probably a reduction gearbox. This uh, might be a clutch um, to actually lock. So when the the, the motor is not running, then this is all locked up to stop it moving. This is probably a limit sensor because there is another one of those about 75 centimetres up on the, the other part of the pole. So that is probably a limit switch. All right, this is the assembly that was mounted at on the front of the machine. This seems to have the outputs that went to the tools. Uh, so I believe that is the, the main handpiece. Um, there was one that was labelled. Let's just have a look at the plastic uh, just so we can get this get this right. So the top connector was for the, the main FACO tools. The second one is labelled as a bipolar diathermy output, 10 watts into 500 ohm load, 1 megahertz. Now I believe that uh, diathermy is some kind of RF cutting and um, sort of ablation and um, cauterizing tool. Um, so it's interesting that it uses uh, RF to do that. So I'm guessing that's probably in this bit here. And I've no idea what that is. Right, this is the back of that board. I don't really understand anything that's going on here. We've got a couple of large, uh, couple of transformers there, um, and here as well. So presumably there's obviously, obviously some RF stuff going on, and uh, this also supplied power to the the main Faco hand tool. So there's probably going to be some kind of power supply for that as well. There's three large power devices down there which are attached to um, uh, that heat sink and then that to that one and then to this main main heat sink here. Caps are then Nichicon, 105 degree rated. Well, let's have a look now at this uh, 
embedded computer uh, made by Zyatec Corp. So we've got a number of cards plugged in here. These all look to be manufactured by Zyatec, so these are potentially, you know, you can buy a base system and then add in boards as you need them. They've probably got different types of boards for doing different various different things, I would imagine. But it looks like there is a complete computer in here. Um, let's take each one of these cards out and uh, we'll have a look at them individually. Now, I can't actually get these out because there's a retention bracket in here, which just has to be released. Presumably, yeah, that just slides up. Yeah, there's not much on the edge connector on that one. Um, not a lot there. It says uh, Allegan PCB assembly CPU video interface. Um, this port went up to the LCD panel. So that just transfers over from the board below. And there's not really a lot on there. Yeah, it looks like this is the CPU board. We've got a, I'm gonna guess that's a memory module. Um, there is a processor in there somewhere. What that is, um, hard to tell. Uh, we've also got this card on the top here. Um, that is labeled SVGA flat panel control. So that plugs into a couple of headers just here and just up at the back there as well. Yeah. 486 single board computer. Uh, there's also a Microsoft sticker on there as well, so maybe running an embedded um, Windows. Um, that looks like an Intel. I see there we've got uh, the battery for the clock and a few other bits and bobs. So let's uh, see if we can get this clip off here and we'll see what 486 it actually is. Ah, I can't see. Oh, sod it. I can always put some thermal paste on it. Right, there we go, we have uh, an Intel 486DX4100, pretty much one of the last 486s. And it looks like that's the video board. So we've got a chips device there, presumably VGA uh, video controller, and uh, we've got a VGA BIOS there, and uh, some RAM. Oop, sorry to interrupt. While I was actually editing this, I have been reading the data sheet for this uh, system. There's a few little details that I just want to go into because they're kind of interesting. So I thought I'd be a bit more complete and add them to the story. So this uh, system is actually uh, known as an STD32 backplane, if you like. Um, it's basically a bus system, uh, which allows you to have a uh, multiple master cards um, on the bus. Um, so you can have a, a CPU card in there and that can plug in and communicate with all the other cards through um, the STD32 bus at the back. Um, actual CPU card, as you've just seen, is a pretty much self-contained 486 computer. Um, there's everything on there that you could possibly need. You've got the processor, the video card. So first off, uh, we have a memory module here. Um, I believe that is eight megabytes. Um, so given it's only running DOS, then that's absolutely fine for that. Um, underneath here you have uh, two flash chips as well uh, for storage. I'm not quite sure how they um, look to the system if you're running MS-DOS, what these actually appear as, I don't know. The data sheet says these are um, two or four megabytes of flash. Uh, given that there's two there, it's possible that uh, these are two meg each. Um, and on the two meg model, there's only one of those fitted. In addition to um, sort of normal PC stuff, you do get two serial ports. You get a watchdog timer, um, speaker interface. The LED on here is software programmable. There is a power monitor. Uh, you can have an optional IDE and floppy interfaces. Now, I believe that those actually uh, mount on the back. Um, 
possibly on just there. There's a footprint for something there, um, which doesn't actually appear to be fitted on here, which is uh, why it looks like the drives are SCSI. Um, the system only runs on 5 volts, so it doesn't need 12 volts or anything like that. It's literally just 5 volts. Um, this interface down the back here is PCI, uh, so that connects directly through to the CPU. Uh, I don't believe it's connected through to the um, STD32 bus, so this video card is local um, to the processor. Uh, allows the video to be much faster because it's, it's far, lo far more local and it's a faster interface. Um, I believe you can get video cards for this system which work over the STD32, but they are obviously a lot slower. Um, it also has DMA support um, between the local memory on this board and the other peripheral devices through the STD32 bus, um, so that allows you to offload some of the data transfer operations to uh, DMA controllers. Uh, I believe there are four of them, there are four channels in total. So and in, in addition to that, there is also a Centronics compatible printer interface uh, on here. I think it's one of these uh, these ports here. The uh, unused port that you can just see down in there. You can see a, um, there's a, a slot for something to plug in just in there. Um, that is for some SRAM to be installed. Uh, so you have some non-volatile RAM uh, available to the system. Uh, obviously, it's not being used in this case. Let's look through the rest of these. Special for Allergan uh, SCSI 2 controller. So we've got an Adaptec SCSI controller BIOS there as well. Next one is um, sound card. Uh, so we've got ZT8944 sound card for Allergan. So we've got on there analog devices sound port and we also have a Yamaha General MIDI sound chip and presumably speaker output and microphone input next one is um, Allergan Medical Optics uh, power driver controller so that was the connector that went out to the the board that did the um, diathermy output and the the FACO hand tools, so that one's going to be fairly custom custom board to interface that into the uh, into the computer. This one is labelled Allegan Quad Serial Interface, so uh, we've always got. Uh, four RS232 serial ports. Yep, COM A, B, C, D, RS232. Yeah, it looks like this could actually be... Oh, no, those are RS485, so presumably this board can be modified to uh, turn the RS232 into 485 as well. Here's, um, again, Allergan Medical Optics. Fluidics controller. So this would have, uh, yeah, the, these connectors went over to the um, peristaltic pumper assembly. Got uh, some custom program devices there. Got a couple of cooling fans on the side there, and that is about it. They've got some power distribution onto the the back plane. Now this assembly is the power supply and it looks like we've got uh, the PC card drive for the uh, memory card that came out of it. And there we go, we've got a three and a half inch SCSI PC card drive. So that could take up to two PC cards uh, and gives you a SCSI interface to them. Okay, I've just got the uh, SCSI interface drive for the uh, PC card plugged into my old PC. So I use this for backwards compatibility. So it's got a uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drive, three and a half inch, and um, that could well live in here as well if it doesn't end up in the Quantel paint box. So I've just got that plugged into my SCSI 2 card, which is down there. You'll have to excuse the poor angle on the screen there, but uh, the uh, 
card is formatted as a FAT32, it's DOS um, 5 formatted, so it's easily readable within Windows. Uh, there's a few executables, I'm not going to bother trying to run them because they probably won't do anything. Um, there's a few log files and stuff to, uh, to look at, but nothing really much to speak of. There's certainly no uh, personal information on here that I can see. It's just the error logs and the actual executables that make the machine work. So the power supply is a Conversion Devices Inc. Uh, model CMD1221. Um, yeah, universal input volt well, input um, 437 watts, and we've got a whole load of outputs. Uh, we've got plus 5 volt. Uh, minus 60 volts, plus six, 60 volts, minus 12 volts, plus 12 volts, um, plus 5, plus 12, minus 12, plus 5, plus 5, 12 volt, plus 12 volt, minus 12 volt, plus 24 volt. I'm not going to take a look in there. It's uh, it's probably a, a, a very good uh, power supply, I would imagine. Probably built... Um, very well, so I'm not going to bother looking inside that. Uh, next up we have the hand control. I went out to um, a Limo style connector. Um, so let's just have a quick look in here. I'm not expecting too much in here, but it might be a, uh, a serial interface. Yeah, it looks like we've got, uh, there's probably a microcontroller under there, and uh, it's just a, a serial interface. Uh, it looks like we've got the same arrangement that we had on the front panel, where they've used uh, fibre optics to light up the uh, key buttons. So there's just an LED there with a load of fibre optics shoved in. Okay, let's have a look at these uh, other items. Uh, we have this... Uh, power thing, uh, we've got uh, what looks like that air pump and the little printer. Uh, right, this unit uh, took the mains input uh, which was into here and then there's just two outputs, um, one of which went to the pump and one went to the main unit up at the top, so I suspect this is probably just a sort of power distribution box thing. Uh, there's a connector on the top, uh, that connected to a switch on the top of the unit, which just turned on and off, so I'm not expecting a huge amount in here. Yes, there's uh, not a huge amount in here, we have the mains input, uh, we've got uh, mains filter, we've got the earth strap down onto a nice uh, bolted um, earth point there and then that runs up to this external earthing point. I presume that's some kind of standard medical device for earthing. Um, mains input then comes over to this board here. We've got a couple of fuses on there as well. Um, interestingly there's actually fuses on the IEC connector as, as well so plenty of fuses going on. Um, we've got a transformer on here and I can just see right down at the back there um, there's uh, at least one diode, so then we've got a little uh, low voltage power supply thing going on here, and that presumably switches uh, this, which is a solid state relay, uh, which has the mains input coming in, and then that goes out to these two IEC connectors there. So, very simple uh, mains input uh, that can get switched through the solid state relay um, from this external switch. Uh, with the low voltage power supplied by this little transformer. Okay, next up we have this printer. Looks fairly off the shelf uh, printer from uh, Citizen, model number CBM920 um, 40PF. That, uh, looking on the data sheet for that, it is a 40 column parallel um, printer. So this is just a standard dot matrix printer with uh, a uh, ink ribbon and a little roll of paper in the back. Um, so this is uh, parallel, so it is a, just a standard Centronics interface and they have very kindly provided a nice um, Centronics uh, port on the back. Um, this connector here is the five volt power, so that is quite a nice usable little, uh, little printer there. 
And next up we have this, uh, this large silver box. Um, this is presumably an air pump. Um, it's pretty heavy, uh, must be getting on for seven, eight kilos, I would have thought. So just a steel external box, we've got an external fan that is um, looking on the back of that, that is 24 volt. Right, let's just have a quick look around this. Uh, so we have a large toroidal transformer in the bottom there. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this is so heavy. Uh, we've got a motor and pump arrangement and a couple of control boards. Okay, the control boards, they are branded Allegan, um, both that one and the one underneath. Um, we've got, it looks like a programmable device just on there. Uh, we've got the air inlet on the pump outlet that runs through into these We've got a t-piece one runs through to this um, air valve just there and what looks like a pressure sensor just there and then that runs out to the main output now looking at the motor on here this is actually a 110 115 volt motor so um, what they're obviously doing is they've got a, a 240 volt step down transformer to uh, to run the motor so <laughs> seems a bit mad to do that then to uh, presumably obviously couldn't get a, a 240 volt version of the motor yeah. so this device on here is an mc68hc 711e9cfn2 um, presumably um, um, a 68000 generation microcontroller uh, so this looks like the sort of brains are on the top and then we've got the power control on this board underneath. Um, we've got a number of unused wires and connectors there. Um, they come out of the transformer. The uh, pump arrangement on here um, is branded Reichel, Reichel Thomas. Um, model number is 107 CAB18 and that Apparently is a dry running diaphragm compressor vacuum pump. Um, max flow 0.69 cubic feet per minute, max pressure 30 psi, max vacuum 22.1 inches of mercury. And given that we have uh, the air filter here and arrows pointing that way, then presumably it's a, a set up for pressure. Uh, we've got two ports there, I wonder whether you, if if you want to sort of reverse it and have it for vacuum, you can literally just swap those, swap those over. And the last thing to look at is the foot switch. Um, now I'm, um, I'm actually not going to look at it because uh, it's, it looks like it's going to take me a bit of time to get into it. And also, it's all full of, uh, it's really grim in there. There's like hairs and all sorts. So, you know what? It probably is just a foot switch that just goes up and down, and there's. Um, side to side switches there, so it's probably just a load of switch arrangements anyway, so I'm uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm gonna leave that one Right, that is pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed watching this uh, teardown of the AMO Sovereign FACO machine and As I mentioned on my update video, I did not too long ago uh, these bits specifically the uh, the embedded computer power supply this um, board uh, the peristaltic pump and uh, valve assembly and the air pump. Uh, I'm going to hold on to these for a period of time and see if anybody's interested in them buying them off me. Um, obviously these will be going pretty cheap because I can't really verify that they work properly. So selling uh, little things like this always helps to pay for future teardowns and uh, keeping my channel running. So um, anything is gratefully appreciated. Okay everybody, thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Bye for now.